A few weeks ago, I did not know what a hyperbaric instrument was all about. I'd heard the term. I knew there was something that you go into when you have the bends, that is, you're diving and you come up too fast. It'll take your life, so they put them in hyperbaric chambers. I had heard of that, but I did not know exactly what it was. But I was walking uphill in a 35 mile an hour wind, holding my cell phone and tripped and fell and ripped a whole hunk of skin off this thumb. And the doctor said, if you can have a hyperbaric chamber in which you can go in, it will ward off infection and it'll heal much more rapidly. So I found one and they have all different sizes and shapes of them, but the one I found was built like a casket. <laughs> it was a long casket in which you climb in and you lie down. Now, you lie down means that you're alive. You lay down means that you're dead. So I, I'm in this hyperbaric chamber and they close the gate and you breathe pure oxygen under pressure. It's exactly like you're diving in 40 or 50 or 60 feet of water. And I stayed in there about an hour and 40 minutes for seven days straight in order to promote healing and to ward off infection. Now, what do you do? <laughs> Flat of your back, all closed in a coffin for an hour and 40 minutes a day. Well, after you pray and think and plan and reminisce, I can look through the glass and see that five minutes had gone by. And so I thought, what a great place to write a sermon on Easter than caught in a coffin. <laughs> Perfect place. So I began writing the message that I'll share with you today from inside a coffin. And I thought about this very moment. Easter Sunday morning, went on five different continents, in churches of all sizes and all situations, in amphitheaters, in coliseums, in stadiums, in the backside of nowhere, right in the middle of a metropolitan area. You have churches worshiping and people by the millions upon millions upon millions Christians. And the worship leader steps out and he says, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Perfect response. And that happens all over the world. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I've talked to a lot of people about that historical fact. And so many have said to me, well, if you can prove to me scientifically that Christ did indeed conquer the grave and was dead and was brought back to life, then I will believe. I hated to insult the intelligence of those who said this, but I'm telling you, that's not how you prove anything historically through the scientific method. That's like saying, I want to check my blood pressure the way I do it. I, I check how much pressure is in my tire. They're totally two different things. Descartes describe for us exactly what the scientific method is. And in pedestrian terms, the scientific method is truth is revealed by experiment. And you have to be in a closed atmosphere with the exact same conditions, and you have to test something over and over and over again. And if you get the same results, then that has been proven scientifically. You cannot prove scientifically that you were in worship this Easter. You cannot prove it. It's impossible by definition. So how do we prove history in the past? Let's have a simple definition of history. 
History is knowing and discovering truth based on testimony. So there's bibliographical truth. You look at internal and external evidence. And you look at historical legal proof. You have to say, is there an eyewitness? Is there a written account? And are there artifacts that would prove this? So I can tell you, as we look at the fact of the resurrection, it is not a myth. It is not a legend. It's not, oh, I hope that is true. There has been no other event in history, no other event that has been more thoroughly examined and analyzed and questioned by people of every discipline you can name throughout the ages. You see, we know more about Jesus prior to his crucifixion and resurrection and about Jesus after his crucifixion and resurrection than we do any other single individual in all of history. So we come and we say, well, how do we determine whether or not this is true? Now, ladies and gentlemen, if the bodily resurrection is not true, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, everything about else about Christianity is invalid. But the fact that that is a historical affirmed fact, it nails down everything Jesus said and did throughout his entire life. So Christ is risen. So let's look at some of the evidence. First of all, there's a mountain of circumstantial evidence. And we could spend hours and hours on each one of the facts that we see in circumstantial evidence. First of all, there was the Roman seal around the tomb. In that day, you did not break that Roman seal without the penalty of death, number one. Number two, there was a stone there that weighed about, oh, one and a half to two tons. And it was rolled away and it was rolled uphill. Explanation for that. On top of that, you look in the tomb, you see the grave clothes and they were intact. It's as if something was in there and it was gone. And there was the face piece that was folded over to one side. All of this circumstantial evidence. And what about the Roman guards? That's an interesting story indeed. And what about the fact that following the resurrection, Peter stood right there in that place a few days after and proclaimed and said to all the people, you have crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. And interesting, the Jews didn't protest that. The Romans didn't say, well, that's not true because there were too many people that knew that was absolutely fact because they had witnessed it themselves. And 3,000 people believed and then a few weeks later, 5,000 people believe. That's the reason people say, well, I don't want to be a part of a big church. You would have been a part of the first church because they had all of these members there, about eight or 9,000 the first three or four weeks they came into existence. So we look at the circumstantial evidence and it is overwhelming. And then we would love to have Empirical evidence, empirical evidence would be someone who actually saw and witnessed the event. We know that Jesus, following his resurrection, we know he made 11 appearances in 40 days. In those 11 appearances, he appeared to people who wanted to not believe anything about him. That would be his half-brother, James. Billy Graham was asked, what is the one fact that both proves to you the resurrection of Jesus? He said, his brother, his half brother. He said, you can fool everybody, but you can't fool your brother. And James came to believe. What about my buddy, Doubting Thomas? Jesus appeared there in the resurrection body, there in the upper room with the apostles. Tom wasn't there. And when they told him, he, he has conquered the grave as he prophesied that he would, Thomas says, I'm not going to have any of that. I'm not going to believe that unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, I see in his side the sword that was, I'm not going to believe that. But then just a few days later in the upper room again and Thomas were there and Jesus whoosh, appeared in the middle of them and Jesus went to him and said, Tom, Tom, check out my hands. Tom, you don't believe this, check out my side. 
Thomas didn't do that. He just fell down and said, my Lord and my God. You see, the evidence is there. People saw experience of all walks of life. And finally, he appeared to over 500 men, and they didn't count the women in the biblical account. There'd be four or 500 women as well. And he appeared to them. Now, just imagine, you're in a court of law. And the question was, did Jesus actually conquer the grave? And you would call these witnesses there to stand and you'd give them about six minutes apiece to give their testimony and a, a minute or two of cross-examination, you would have over 50 hours of testimony affirming the fact that Christ is risen. Is risen I could win that case in any court of law. The witness would be absolutely overwhelming. And just a little added thing, and there are many things here. The apostles, were martyred, 11 of them. Only John lived to be an old age on the island of Patmos. All the rest of them were martyred. Now, a lot of people will give their life for causes, right? Oh, I gave my life for this. I gave my life for this. You know of any illustration in history where someone gave their life for something they knew was a lie? Those apostles knew that he'd conquered the grave, and they gave their life on the basis of that experience they'd had personally. You'd think they would have laid down their life all over the world for something they knew to be not true. So we stand here today, and we see circumstantial evidence, overwhelming evidence, and we can be confident that the resurrection of Jesus is not a myth, it's not a legend. It's not, I hope so. I hear people, well, I hope so. No, there's no hope about it. It is absolutely historically true. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. But then, lying in that coffin, something else hit me. And I said, well, I understand Jesus was God man. God raised him from the dead, his only begotten son. What about me? What about you? And then you can look at the Gospel of John and you see a wonderful statement. It says, because Christ lives, I too shall live. Would you respond? Because Christ lives, I too shall live. What is that about? What is the proof that we will be a part of that resurrection? Life leaves this body, we will be there. What is the affirmative about that? John 14, in my Father's house and many mansions, said Jesus, I go there to prepare a place for you, and I'm going ahead of you, and where I am, he says, if you're in my family, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you and I'm going to bring you to where I am. And he said to those apostles, you know the way to get there. And you know where I'm going. Talk about life after this life. But once again, my man Thomas, he said, Jesus, we don't know where you're going after you're dead. He said, we don't know how to get there. And then you have that tremendous words of our Lord. He said, I am the way. I'm going to come and get you. He said, I am the truth. He said, I am the life. Wonderful, wonderful words, nails it down. And then on in John, Jesus says to his apostles, all his followers, just like he's saying to us today, he said, I am in the Father, God. He said, the Father God is in me. And he says, you have received me, and also you are with me, and you are in me. How did that happen? The basics, ladies and gentlemen, this Easter. Conviction of sin. Anybody have a problem with that? I've messed up. I've failed. I've lied. I've cheated. I, I, we've broken all the commandments. Everybody here. Conviction of sin. Then there is confession of sin. When you confess sin, oh, the Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Spell it out. Conviction of sin. Confession of sin. And then you repent from all known sin. Repentance means 
I've been following this direction, my own selfishness, and I turn around and I turn away from that. I know that is wrong, and I go in another direction, and I change my direction, and I change my mind about that which has been pulling me away from God. And then the final thing is, you receive Jesus Christ. John says, those who receive him, that's Jesus, to them he gives the power to become a son and a daughter of God, and then we're in the family of God. As God the Father raised his son, so he'll raise every member of his family, and you and I are members of his family when we've asked Jesus to come in and to salvage us, to save us, and we say, Lord, I want you to run my life from this day forward. There we know and have the assurance Christ is risen, is risen indeed. because Christ lives. And then he explains this so beautifully in 1 Corinthians 15. You want to know about resurrection? Read 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, Paul, inspired by divinity, answers all the questions that we have. Look at it in verse number 20. It says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of all those who fall asleep, all those who died. For since by man came death, the body you have, the body I have is not gonna live forever. Don't wanna surprise anybody. C.S. Lewis said 100% of the people will die and that percentage will never increase. <laughs> For since by man came death, by man, a capital N, by Christ also, comes the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, that's us, all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits of those who are in Christ in his coming. What is this saying? He's saying because you and I have received Christ and Christ is in us and we are in him, Jesus is the first one that God the Father brought back to life who was dead, and he is the drum major in the parade, and he's walking out in the parade, and all of those will be following after them, after him who dead in Christ. That is the promise of Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Because Christ lives, I too shall live. He is leading the parade of all of those who follow him from that day after. Then there's more questions. Verse number 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? Good question. And with what body do they come? Paul says, foolish question, foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you, what you sow do not sow the body that shall be but mere grain perhaps wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed his own body. We live, ladies and gentlemen, all around examples of resurrection. Have you noticed? Have we forgotten? Do we take it? You put a little acorn in the ground, huh? It dies, soil, nurture, water, and that acorn grows up to be a big old oak tree. Oh, it had to die before it could be totally full and magnificent. That's true of everything. Man, resurrection is everything you see growing, all the plants you see, everything that is alive in the world. It has come by death into resurrection. There you have a worm that's squiggling around, and that worm goes in a cocoon and comes out a butterfly metamorphosis, resurrection. People say, I don't understand resurrection. You can't look in any direction and not see death brought back into life, and there has to be death before there can be life. That's the beauty and the principle. You think this happens in every aspect of nature and every aspect of creation, and it's not available for all of us who are made in the very image of God, and particularly, especially those who are in the family of God because we've received him to save us and to run our lives. 
What a wonderful promise. And look at the rest of it. It even gets more beautiful than this. We tell exactly how God is working. Look at verse number 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. That's your body, my body, this dust body. It is raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a supernatural, spiritual body. There's a natural body. There's a spiritual body as it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. We're in Adam's lineage. Oh, yes, but the last Adam, that's Jesus, became life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not the first, but the natural. And after the spiritual, the first man was of the earth, made of dust, Adam. The second man, the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those who are made of dust, that's you and me, as in the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Now listen to verse 49. And as we have borne the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Look what happened. Jesus Christ, heavenly man, came into this world, the incarnation, and put on the body of dust, put on the human man, and that human man in his weakness demonstrated that you and I could be strong, and that human man, Jesus, was crucified and died on the cross and rose again and had again his supernatural body. That's how it worked. Jesus came, supernatural body, came and had a natural body. In that natural body, he took upon himself all the gross and sin and you and me, and then God raised him from the dead, and now he has his supernatural body again. What kind of body are you going to have? When we die, this, oh, your body is not made for heaven, folks. Your body is not made for glory. My body is not made for there. This is the dusty body, but in Jesus Christ, when we die, we live, and therefore we have a supernatural body. The prototype, more a prototype, the resurrected body of Jesus. He ate fish. He bumped around with people. He defied gravity. He appeared. That is a beginning prototype of the supernatural body we're going to have that will equip us to live in a new atmosphere of glory and eternity. If you think heaven is going to be just playing harps, unless you like the harp, or is it going to be floating around the idea, I'm a soul floating around? No, we will have a body made for heaven and made for eternity, and we begin to fulfill things we never even dreamed we'd fulfill under the assignment of God forever and forever and ever. You see, Christ is risen. He is risen and because Christ lives, Christ look at the icing on the cake of Easter. Verse number 50. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You've got two kingdoms. You've got the flesh and blood kingdom, right? That's the one we live in. You have the kingdom of God right over here. That's the eternal kingdom. And here you have who is going to win. We live in the flesh and blood kingdom. Guess what? Those in that kingdom, we are corruptible. Don't have to explain that. And we say, well, I want to live as long as I can. And we know a lot about longevity. We certainly want to do in this temple. How do we do that? Read any book you want to read, any modern study on how to increase your life. It has to do with exercise, has to do with eating, has to do with sleep. One, two, three. You'll find that in different forms always. So therefore, we want to do that, but that cannot become your religion. People go to the gym, when they eat right, we sleep. Oh, I want to live. Let me tell you something. The bottom line is, one day, breath will leave our body, right? It's called death. It's called death. And death is not a mystery. Well, death is a mystery. No, here God revealing to Paul to us exactly 
all that's behind death, and he does it in this very, very verses that we're dealing with right now. What does he say? He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. No mystery about death. We shall not all sleep, we'll not stay dead, but we shall be changed, shazam, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, and the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, Woo. and we shall be changed. For the corruptible, that's the old life, the dead life must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, and when the corruptible has put on incorruption and the mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. In other words, bang, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this which has been corruptible, which has died, now will be resurrected, it'll be incorruptible. This which has been mortal, we didn't make it through this life, no one is going to, now we become immortal. And now we have that resurrected body and death is swallowed up in victory. Man, what a wonderful moment that is. I love the little story about Lazarus. Lazarus, you remember, was dead four days, four nights. God went and resuscitated him, brought him back to life. It is said that years later, he was in Rome. He was telling all people about, in Christ you live forever, in Christ you have a new life on this earth. He was saying that, and people were believing and following. Here's a man who was dead. Christ had resuscitated, brought back to life. They were listening to him. And the Romans came and said, too many people are listening. If you don't stop telling the story of your life and your resuscitation and the promise of the resurrection of Jesus, we're going to kill you. And Lazarus said, you're going to kill me? They said, absolutely. And he started to laugh. <laughs> he just, and the soldiers, they, he just laughed and laughed. And, and they said, we're going to get, he said, I know I heard what you said. And he kept on laughing. He said, don't you guys know death is dead? And ladies and gentlemen, that is Easter. Death is dead. It's no longer there. Death is swallowed up in victory. Let's say it again. Death is swallowed up, hold your hands up, in victory, everybody. Death swallowed up in victory. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. If Christ, because Christ is alive, I too shall live. Death is swallowed up, destroyed in victory. Say it again. Death is swallowed up, make that V, in victory. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the total truth and the wonderful truth of Easter.